Guten Morgen. And that is the extent of my Dutch. I apologize. <laughs> I'm very honored to be here with you this morning. Uh, what a wonderful gathering, what a wonderful conference. And I hope, it's very difficult to follow a compelling act like those dancers we saw a moment ago, but I hope I'm able to help you understand a little bit more about how decisions are made by politicians, by payers such as insurance companies, about the work that you do. So this may or may not be exciting for some of you. It's exciting for me. And as uh, was said, my wife uh, is a physiotherapist. My mother was a physiotherapist for 40 years. And I've practiced this presentation with them several times. And when they start nodding off, I know it's time to finish. <laughs> So the World Bank predicts that by next year, 10% of the world's GDP will be spent on health care. That makes health care the largest industrial sector, larger than tourism, larger than transportation, larger than energy, the largest sector. And they estimate that next year, it'll be worth approximately 7.6 trillion euros. That is a lot of money. The portion that is spent on physiotherapy is estimated, and frankly it's my estimation, but based on some research, at 152 billion euros next year. So that represents approximately 2% of healthcare spending, but it's still a very significant number. And we'll see in the opening part of this presentation that when we talk about that kind of finance, that large and economic sector, we can't only talk about it in terms of clinical relevance or even economics. It's extremely political. And I know you're experiencing that here in the Netherlands at the moment. So in my talk, I'm going to be a little bit impolite and bring up philosophy and politics and religion. And I know my grandmother would tell me not to, but it's important in the context of this presentation. Health economics in and of itself is a science, it's a study, but it's only one part of the decision-making process, and we'll explore that further in this presentation. I hope, there we go. So the gentleman on the left is John Stuart Mill, and he is often credited with founding modern principles of progressivism and liberalism. And his belief was that it's human nature to constantly strive to improve, to take what we have and make it better, make a better world. It's a moral imperative to continuously improve. The fellow on the right, de Chateaubriand, is credited with founding the modern notion of conservatism. And he wasn't necessarily a closed-minded person, in fact, he was a brilliant scholar. But what he suggested was that the human animal is inherently flawed. We are inherently greedy. We are inherently selfish. And these behaviors will not change even as society progresses. So we're always limited by that natural uh, state of our being. And you can, of course, apply that to healthcare. When you think of the tremendous progress that we make, and yet we always seem to be one step short of where we want to be due to our limitations. So the philosophy of healthcare progress is very interesting to contemplate in this presentation. And of course, as I said, <laughs> healthcare is extremely political. You cannot <laughs> spend that kind of money without considering who's winning, who's losing, who's getting more this year, who's losing more this year. It's an extremely political, politicized field. And we can't ignore that, and we can't wish it away. It's very important when we look at the value of this profession that we understand that it's always being examined in the political context. And finally, a, a little bit of religion to say that I truly believe that it takes a benevolent deity to actually achieve the kind of healthcare system we want. So say your prayers. So in the recent decade or so, we've talked a lot about value-based healthcare, and I'm sure you've all heard that expression. And what it simply means is that we've shifted from counting outputs to
to looking at outcomes. So it's no longer how much of this procedure, how much of that, but what does it actually do for patients and for population health. So we've become outcomes driven. We've adopted what we call patient centeredness, which means instead of building our systems around practitioners or institutions, we're supposed to be building them around what patients need. And finally, we've introduced the concept of competition on results. And all that really means is that we favor those things which yield good outcomes, and we try and get rid of the things that don't. It's easier said than done. There are some challenges to implementing value-based care, and some of them are very urgent these days. For one, demand constantly outstrips our capacity, and demand is increasing with aging populations in Europe and North America, with growing populations in certain other parts of the world, we simply can't keep up with demand. And value-based care has introduced regulatory complexity. And that means, for example, we have to open up access to health records. But what does that mean when we think of privacy? Um, how do we encourage new scopes of practice without stepping on other <coughs> professions' toes? And how do we apportion risk in healthcare? It used to be that the doctors paid for all the risk through their insurance, but how do, we, how do we regulate risk properly? And finally, human resources. We simply don't have enough human resources, people who want to do this kind of work, especially as we transition from tertiary care centers and hospitals into primary care. So these are some of the things that are holding us back in our introduction of value-based care. And recently, we've shifted from value-based care to what we're calling smart health care. And that is all the benefits of value-based care added on top, things like data and analytics, informed and active patients. So no longer patient-centered care, but now patients are actually making decisions and able to see their progress in real time. And universal portable health records. So smart health care is the new language. We've moved away from value-based into smart health care. And I'm not an expert on smart care as it applies to physiotherapy, but Dr. Brian Caulfield gave a really good presentation a few years ago at ERWCPT, and I'd encourage you to pay more attention to what he says about smart care and physiotherapy. We are witnessing exponential technologies in healthcare. And what I mean by that is technologies that's able to disrupt our industry, disrupt our sector overnight and change it in ways that we can't imagine. Things like analytics and machine learning applied to large data sets, biosensors and trackers, everybody has them, including me here, 3D printing and nanotechnology, so you know, customized stents and um, all kinds of ways that we can be bringing custom services to patients. Companion diagnostics, that's actually monitoring in real time the benefits of a prescription of pharmaceutical and changing its dosage in real time. Of course, robotics in surgery, uh, robotics in all kinds of new ways to apply, helping patients become more mobile. Artificial intelligence and soon synthetic biology. Imagine what that means to physiotherapy if we are able to reproduce, regrow tissues. So those technologies are disrupting healthcare, and that's the environment that we're working in. So as an organization, as a profession of physiotherapists, you have to be able to articulate your value in the context of all that change and continue to articulate your value. So how do we do that? There is a continuous cycle of learning, applying that learning to practice, measuring the outcomes of new, way, of new modalities, collecting the data, analyzing it, setting it to economic models which prove its value, and hopefully that economic model drives policy change. We'll talk about the economics part of that cycle, but you can see how that's continuous, ongoing, and it's important that you be part of that process. The value equation. It's a very simple concept to understand. It's perceived benefit divided by cost. <coughs> and remember that word perceived. It's a very subjective thing, value. 
We can measure it, but understand that it's always in the eye of the beholder. So perceived benefit divided by cost. And my favorite example of understanding value is the rubber band. Very inexpensive, very useful in very many different places, um, and it really does a lot more than what you pay for it. So a rubber band is great value. Lots of benefit, low cost. In healthcare, as you can imagine, especially in rehabilitation, perceived benefit can be defined as the change in state from illness to health, or from impaired mobility to return to mobility. So that change in state from beginning to end. And of course, another way to say <laughs> that is outcome. So outcome divided by cost is a great way to express the value of physiotherapy. Very logical, right? So the perceived benefit or outcome of physiotherapy is very easily understood in the context of the interaction between the patient and the physiotherapist. Now, when a patient is in for treatment, they'll see many different health professionals, including the physiotherapist, and they have a pretty good idea of what value they're getting for that treatment right away. As you move up, you see that in a department, for example, in a hospital, there are multiple practitioners, multiple modalities, frequent interactions between professionals, and the patient is, or sorry, the physiotherapist is a slightly narrower band relative to the entire objectives of that department. So it's important to be able to express your value within that department, because it's not as obvious to the departmental administrators as it is to your patient. And then, of course, we move up to much broader considerations of value. So we go from the department to the broad hospital, and as many of you can attest, most senior hospital administrators don't know who physiotherapy, what physiotherapy is or who the physiotherapists are. Then from there, we move into municipalities and regions and up into ministries of health, where their perceptions of value are based on population health, not just interactions. And finally, up to cabinet-level decision-making, where they're comparing value in healthcare to value in, for example, environmental care and defense and education. So all the while, as you're moving up through these considerations, you have to be able to articulate your value as a profession, but in different contexts, much different contexts from one to the other. So it's very important to do that. We're, we're measuring the same data, we're using the same information, but we are contextualizing it for much different audiences. The science of economics is really the science of understanding choice, the choices that people make. And substitution is a term we use when we observe different choices or choices being made by consumers to use one thing instead of another. And often that decision is affected by price. So again, value is benefit divided by price. <coughs> Oftentimes it's availability. We just have no access to one service, so we'll use another. At the consumer level, substitution doesn't happen very often, and I'll show you why in a moment. But it sure does happen very frequently at the administrative level and at the government level. And in fact, it's happening more and more often. The entire movement of healthcare from tertiary centers into primary care centers is about substitution. We don't need physicians to do all of these routine functions. We can diversify and substitute. So again, keep that in mind as we articulate the value of physiotherapy, is are you comparing yourself to a possible substitution? And if so, what is your benefit? It has to be very clear and well articulated. I don't know why I'm pointing at the screen to click, but that's a bad <laughs> habit. Um, so let's talk a little bit for a moment about price elasticity. So price elasticity is just a simple way of measuring the effect of price change on consumption of a, of a good or a service. And simply put, it's measured as 1% of change in price affects what percent of change of demand. And a ratio of minus 1 indicates balance. So if you, if you increase your price by 1%, then consumption goes down by 1%. So anything from minus 1 to 0 represents what we call inelasticity. 
So that means that the price change doesn't really affect consumption all that much. And of course, healthcare is considered very inelastic, especially if you're very sick, because really price at that point doesn't matter all that much. Physiotherapy, interestingly, I've only come across one proper study on price inelasticity. I'm doing some work on it myself right now. Uh, physiotherapy appears to be a little more elastic, if you will, more price sensitive than many other health interventions, but it's still, again, very inelastic in global terms. But one thing that we must consider, these behaviors, elasticity, and it's been studied quite a bit in, uh, in the Netherlands, but, but not physiotherapy, but very broadly. Um, these changes focus on the decisions of the individual. We do not have a very good idea of inelasticity relative to third-party payers and substitution. So again, these kinds of behaviors are things that we need to know much more about and need to invest in studying. And so when your association asks you for support with this kind of work, it's very important that you understand what they're trying to achieve. So let's shift a little bit and talk about perceived benefit and, and how we quantify benefit. One of the ways economics quantifies benefit is through what we call quality-adjusted life years, or qualies. And many of you, I'm sure, have looked at qualies before. And simply put, it's the difference between life expectancy and quality of life with an intervention or without. So in this example, uh, let's say someone has diabetes. If they receive no treatment at all, their life ends very quickly and it's quite miserable. With treatment, we extend their life and we add quality of life. So that's, that's a quality. But remember, that's only measuring benefit. It's not measuring value because we haven't introduced cost yet. So how do we do that? Through ICERs, incremental cost effectiveness ratios. And what that is, is measuring the change in quality by the change in cost. So now we have qualies and dollars, and that allows us a measure of value. So this is what it looks like. So for example, we have a cancer treatment that costs $100,000 and yields 10 qualies. We have a different treatment, twice as expensive, so another $100,000 that's netting two more qualies. So our ICER, our cost effectiveness ratio, is $50,000 per quality. Again, very simple and a very common measure used in healthcare. In fact, well, I'll get to the reference in a moment. So laid out on a quadrant like this, you'll see that anything that increases qualities and decrease your costs, that's a no-brainer. You're going to go for that. Then you have a threshold. In this case, we've just used $20,000 per quality that if it's within that threshold, yes, we'll invest in that. If it's above, well, maybe, maybe not, and we'll get to decisions on why not later. And of course, once you pass a certain, certain threshold, we really shouldn't invest in that. And then, of course, if you happen to be unlucky enough to have something more expensive that produces really bad results, well, you shouldn't even be looking at it. This study, um, was published in Physical Therapy, which is the American uh, journal, um, authored by several Dutch authors. Um, and it is, at the moment, the best analysis, <coughs> systemic review of uh, ICERs applied to physiotherapy. So I would encourage you to have a look at that when you get a chance. So I like this example, and a, a colleague of mine, another economist in Canada, produced this. And what it does is it shows the problems in using ICERs. So here we have acceptance of new pharmaceuticals by Health Canada over a, over a decade. And they had an ICER threshold of approximately $40,000 per quality. And so you should see everything below that should be green and everything above that should be red. And yet this looks very random. Why is that? Well, the answer comes back to politics. There are decisions to approve based on pressure from patient groups. There are decisions to deny based on unavailability of resources, even though it does meet threshold. So there's a lot more to healthcare decision making than just measurement, just clinical outcome, 
just cost. And that is why in Canada we adopted what we call multi-criteria decision analysis. So this is basically an exercise, an economic exercise, of putting ourselves in the minds of politicians, health administrators. What criteria are they applying to the decisions as to whether they're going to spend more on physiotherapy? In our case, so it's a process that's very simple to understand. You define your scope, you select the criteria, you develop a rating scale, you identify your allocation options, you rate those options, and you validate the scores. So it's a subjective process that's laid out in an objective methodology, which is stuff that economists like me just love. <laughs> So it's important to remember that you're applying clinical factors, economic factors, and political factors to your estimate as to whether or not this change is going to be approved by decision makers. So in Canada, we chose these criteria. And you'll see there's cost, there's qualities, there's effectiveness, many of the traditional measures. But we also added some interesting ones. How likely? Are we going to be able to move this through a political process? What's the impact on resources five years from now? What's the acceptability in the professional community? So those ratings we added to this process, and those are subjective ratings. We took subject matter experts and we put them in a room and said, best guess. Now again, if you're an academic and you're a researcher, you're not supposed to approve of best guess, but it's an effective methodology to understand the political process. We looked across these 13 practice areas and applied our 11 criteria. We came up with a matrix that looks like this. So each one of these boxes represents a review of the literature to answer those questions. And what we wound up with is an analysis that yield a probability index for each one of those sectors, saying we were likely going to succeed here, we're unlikely to succeed there, or we don't have enough information yet to make a decision. So it's a very elaborate process, but it allows you to become a very powerful advocacy force in using this methodology. So just some very quick examples for you. In rehab, we identified reduced mortality by up to 25%, savings of nearly $5,000, low implementation costs and little disruption. In stroke, 81% of Im improvements in independent living, early mobilization yields tremendous savings and again, very easy to implement. Joint arthroplasty, again, good results, low political cost to implement, and the same with physiotherapy in the ICU. False prevention is maybe one of the most impactful applications of physiotherapy in terms of savings and benefits to patients and to overall healthcare systems. So that is an example of how we measure the value of physiotherapy using this MCDA process. So I'll finish off by answering the question or posing the question to you and answering it for you, which is as a clinician, as a member of my profession, what can I do to support this kind of political activity? And of course, you could go out and wave a placard that says, yay, physiotherapy. But I think there's a more important aspect to this and a more impactful set of behaviors. The first is contribute to the evidence. We do not have enough good data on clinical practice on a day-to-day -day basis. So record your outcomes, participate in clinical trials, support the collection of data and evidence. <clears throat> Maybe most importantly, focus on outcomes. Focus on a quality intervention with your patient. Their perceived benefit should be unquestioned. Simply put, be the best clinician you can be. And finally, continue the best aspect of physiotherapy, which is the tremendous empathy that's inherent in this profession. 
I said when I presented this information in uh, Liverpool a couple of years ago that this profession is love. It is a profoundly giving profession. And if you want to talk about an impactful way to have your patients perceive benefit, just continue being that light throughout their treatment. They will thank you for it, your profession will benefit for it, and healthcare will improve. So thank you very much for listening. I hope this has been helpful to you, and I wish you continued success in your practice. Thank you.